Good morning. I'm Peter Kovacs. I'm the editor of The Advocate and The Times-Picayune, and we're sitting here today in the governor's office for a virtual town hall with Governor John Bell Edwards. Governor, Peter. welcome. Thank you, Peter. It's good to be with you. Um, our town hall today is brought to you by the good folks at AARP, and before we get started, we'll have a short word from them. Hello, I'm Bobby Savoy, AARP Louisiana State President. Like you, I just want life to get back to normal. We can do this, Louisiana. With thousands of people getting the vaccine every day, we're making progress. Let's keep it up. AARP is proud to sponsor today's roundtable to help get the information we need, whether it's facts about the vaccine or how we can all safely get back to the life we want to live. March, and I think you were fixing to get vaccinated or in the middle of getting vaccinated? I don't recall exactly. Well, I, I did get vaccinated, um, and I was very thankful, and, and certainly I want to encourage everybody to make the decision that I made and to do it as, as soon as possible. But yes, I am fully vaccinated. Uh, yeah, I knew you were because we discussed <laughs> it, um, and, and I was, we were both discussing our, our vaccination experiences. Um, anyhow, I think both of us probably thought we wouldn't be doing any more town halls, but uh, here we are back again. Um, for well, we, I don't mind doing town halls. I just <laughs> wish the subject uh, that was going to dominate uh, the conversation wouldn't be COVID and certainly wouldn't be something called the Delta variant. Well, it is, unfortunately, and we got about uh, 200 questions, and so um, I'll just start firing away. Um, the first question, literally the first question, um, within a minute of us putting a thing online saying you could ask questions came from Bianca of New Orleans, and this was a common question, and she says, will you give the unemployment back? I got COVID at work, and now my whole house is sick with little extra money. Yeah, and I'm assuming she's talking about the, Supplemental uh, the enhanced yeah. compensation benefits, mm -hmm. the federal benefits, $300 mm -hmm. per week. Mm -hmm. Uh, those benefits end September 6th for the whole country. Mm -hmm. And September 6th was picked because at that point, uh, schools are back in session. Mm -hmm. uh, as you know, we, we go back to school much earlier. In fact, schools have already started going back into session uh, this week. Mm -hmm. um, and, and so we, we were targeting uh, early August. Uh, and then a bill passed in the legislature that afforded an additional permanent benefit increase f with state benefits. Mm -hmm. Uh, the first one in, in, I think, a couple of decades, um, but it was premised upon uh, uh, having those enhanced benefits expire by the end of July, July 31st. I did sign that bill into law, um, and I will tell you, uh, they're, they're not going to be, the federal benefits are not going to be extended until September the 6th. Um, the good news out there, are there are tens of thousands of jobs uh, that are available uh, today. Uh, we do encourage people to reconnect uh, with work. And of course, the state benefits uh, for those who, who qualify for them will remain um, you know, available uh, for, for the folks who apply. Yeah, that was a, a, a compromise with Republicans in the legislature. Yeah. And of course, the facts on the ground were a little different when you signed that and agreed to that compromise. Does, well, do well you I, I think that's fair. Um, but, but again, you, you do have a permanent benefit increase mm -hmm. And the difference in, in, the, in the termination of the benefits is about a month. Okay. Um, and, and so <laughs> it, was, it was a compromise, but the legislation was passed, it's been signed. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the, the enhanced federal benefits from this iteration of, 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 uh, of the act that Congress passed uh, will not be available. Uh, if, if for some reason they pass another round of enhanced benefits, then that, that will be different. Would be available. Yeah. Okay. Well, the second question, which uh, arrived eight minutes after we solicited questions, uh, was about football. Yeah. And um, the question is from uh, Simi in Baton Rouge. Um, will LSU football be at 100% capacity for the 2021 season, and will masks be required? You know, I, I don't know the answer to those questions. Those are not decisions that we have to make uh, today. Um, and, and I ne you never know, we, the question uh, from Simi is about the whole season. Mm -hmm. We don't know what uh, things look like two weeks from now, much less two or four months from now. 
but what we did this week, and I'm sure we're going to get into this in more detail, is I reinstated a mask mandate that is for indoors uh, in public spaces. Uh, and, and that applies K through 12. It applies for higher education. Uh, and, and again, in all public uh, settings. Uh, but it's indoors. And, and so right now, I don't have any intention. I don't have any recommendation from CDC or from the Office of Public Health here in Louisiana to extend that to to outdoor uh, locations. And so uh, I don't I don't want to say never because you don't take any tools uh, off the table because you don't know how bad uh, things can get and what recommendations you're going to get uh, tomorrow or next week. Okay. So Dominic from Denham Springs says, um, will vaccinations be required of state employees? Yeah. Um, <clears throat> you know, that's, that's not under consideration um, unless and until, until the FDA grants full licensure to one or more of the COVID vaccines. Um, I think that's going to happen relatively uh, soon, uh, perhaps by Labor Day, based on some New York Times reporting that I saw last night. Uh, and then the, the COVID vaccine would work just like other vaccines that are currently mandatory, and there are a number of them that are on a schedule uh, that the Department of Health uh, keeps, and, and it, it requires those vaccinations, whether it's K through 12, higher education, and so forth. Uh, subject to whatever uh, opt-out provisions are in current law, of course. Uh, and, and so it would be my expectation that once full authorization, or sometimes it's called licensure, is granted, then that uh, vaccine will be added to the list, and, and then it will work just like the current uh, mumps, measles, rubella, uh, and other uh, vaccines. Yeah, okay. Um, uh Jonathan, I'm sorry, J.S. from Baton Rouge asks, what about the illegal immigrants being dropped off by the busloads in Baton Rouge? Might that be the reason for the sudden surge in COVID cases? Well, first of all, no. The reason for the surge in COVID cases is because we didn't take full advantage of the time that we had to get enough of our population uh, fully vaccinated. Uh, currently, we're at about 37.1%. Uh, that's nowhere near enough. And then on top of, of that, you have the Delta variant, uh, which is at least two times uh, as transmissible as earlier forms of, of the virus. Uh, and it's more virulent as well. And it was those two things together, I think, with the, the uh, weather, where this is the hottest, most humid time of the year, frequent rain and so forth, driving people indoors um, mm -hmm. where, where I think the, the virus was able to spread uh, much more quickly. So that's why we have the, the surge here. Uh, and by the way, all 50 states are reporting increasing cases. Now it's, it's much worse here than elsewhere, um, but only to degrees. So whether it's Florida, uh, Arkansas, Missouri, I mean, you name it. Uh, now it is true. and, and I hope we get into this more, that our case rate, our seven-day case rate, uh, so case growth is, is number one in the country. That is not a distinction we should aspire to. Um, but, but the reasons for that are, as I just mentioned, um, and, and quite frankly, uh, you know, I've, I've heard a little bit about some internet back and forth about uh, immigrants being dropped off. I, I'm aware of, of uh, a, a couple instances of that, not even in Baton Rouge. Um, but relatively small numbers in, in uh, Shreveport that wasn't coordinated the way that, that ICE would normally coordinate that. But that is not uh, causing the surge in Louisiana. Okay. Um, the next question comes from Mandy in St. Gabriel. Um, she says, please tell us why the LSU administration refuses to mandate COVID-19 vaccinations despite the unquestionable demands of students, faculty, and staff that the vaccines be required for campus access. Yeah. Well, it's a great question, and, and I think um, it's on a lot of people's minds uh, in particular because uh, in Indiana, mm -hmm. U Indiana University mandated the vaccines in a, a federal district court, and now the Seventh Court of Appeals, U.S. Court of Appeals, has affirmed uh, the, the trial court's decision that that mandate is, is uh, reasonable mm -hmm. and lawful. Yeah. Uh, in Louisiana, we're taking a, a different approach, and, and actually there's some conversations happening with higher education leaders as we sit here. Uh, but the decision has been made to wait until there's full licensure, and that sort of gets us back to the conversation we had just, just a few uh, moments ago as to when the COVID vaccine will be added to 
uh, the schedule uh, mm -hmm. of mandated vaccines, again, subject to the opt-outs that are currently in law, and that's what we can expect at, at higher education as well. And again, that could happen as early as, as Labor Day, and, and I guess e even earlier as possible. Uh, the FDA uh, undertakes the process of reviewing all the data, visiting all the man, uh, manufacturing facilities of the COVID and so forth, uh, of the vaccines, I should say, mm. and they'll, they'll make that determination. Mm. Okay. You know, LSU in the past decade has um, a history of making some bad decisions based on bad legal advice, um, and there are a lot of people in the law school who think they're getting bad legal advice. Do, are you familiar with how they're getting legal advice and are you satisfied with that well first of all I don't know the context of, of the question does that question relate to things that have happened uh, over the years or is that specifically as it relates it, it, to I mean to the bad legal advice vaccine. in the past relates to the sexual abuses yeah. and relates to the presidential search of King Alexander yeah. um, the current question and I know there are people in law school who don't agree with the legal advice they're getting is the legal advice they're getting that they're citing, as I understand it, is that they don't think they can legally mandate the vaccine. Yeah. Well, <clears throat> f first of all, um, I too had concerns um, about advice that, that LSU uh, received and, um, and that they took yeah. uh, mm -hmm. in the past. Uh, I will point out that the King, Alec the, uh, the King Alexander search mm -hmm. uh, methodology was not followed most recently. Yes. And, and I don't believe you could have had a more transparent mm -hmm. search for president than what we just had. That is true. Um, yeah. And whether that was because the legal advice changed or because my directive to them was yeah. different, okay. uh, one way or the other it changed. Um, but I don't, I don't have a, a problem currently with the legal advice that they're getting, whether it's from the executive council there uh, or from from any outside counsel, uh, you know this this is this is not just a legal matter. It's a it's a policy decision about what's going to allow you to get to the vaccination rate that you're looking for uh, the fastest uh, and and have an environment that's conducive to education and, and public health. And I think understanding what the FDA timeline likely looks like um, that that they're making uh, this decision. Uh, and I, you know, I will have an update later this afternoon, but it's not just LSU. I mean, this is all of higher education in, in Louisiana um, that, that is approaching this, it appears, uh, from this same angle. Um, and I'm not going to involve myself in, in that decision. Uh, I, will, I will support that decision, but I do look forward uh, very much to the day that full licensure is granted. Okay. Um Dewana from Zachary <clears throat> asks if we're going back and going back to phase one, and there are a lot of questions about whether this is going to end up in shutdowns or curtailments of business. Yeah. Well, I have no intention of doing that. I have not been requested to do that. That's not a CDC recommendation. It's not anything I've received from the Office of Public Health. Um, I, and I will point out that the least onerous thing we can do uh, in order to try to curb transmission and give some breathing room back to our hospitals uh, it is to reinstate the mask mandate. Uh, because if, if you notice, we didn't close any businesses, we didn't limit any hours, we didn't say that you're limited to a certain capacity. Mm -hmm. It doesn't apply to anything outdoors. And so this is a very targeted and limited approach uh, that we believe will be effective. Uh, the, as you know, the mandate became effective today. It will be in place through September the 1st. We'll, we'll reevaluate as we approach September 1st as to whether uh, to continue it. But we're not looking uh, to, to uh, have any additional restrictions placed on businesses and so forth. And I'm hopeful that we won't have to. Um, but we do need compliance uh, because we know that it works. This is not theoretical anymore. Uh, we've done it uh, here in the state. Uh, previously and we know that mass curb transmission uh, and and that needs to happen now because we have the highest growth rate of cases in the country our percent positivity of tests reached 15.4 percent uh, today mm -hmm. uh, that's up uh, from 13.2 percent previously and when you have increasing percent positivity you you have no reason to believe in fact you have every reason not to believe that you are approaching your peak uh, in, in terms of cases, and that's going to drive continued hospitalizations and, Peter, uh, deaths as well. Uh, 
Uh, 59 deaths reported yesterday, 44 more did today. That's 103 in two days. Mm. A month ago, we were reporting like two a day. Yeah, yeah. You know, That's and so, so, I mean, this is very <coughs> serious. And, and the capacity at our hospitals is, is, is just absolutely strained. And mm. it's a staffing uh, issue. Uh, and so we have to give a break to, to our hospitals so that they can render life-saving care, not just for COVID patients, but for all of their patients. Yeah. Um, <coughs> Um, Here is from Jolie in New Orleans. Uh, I have jury duty, and I'm concerned about being around unvaccinated people. Why do I have to be forced to be around unvaccinated people? You know, um, <clears throat> the I have not heard anything uh, from the Supreme Court uh, or the judicial branch about any changes that they're making, and, and I'm not going to get into whether they should or shouldn't. I'm just going to ask her to direct that question um, to um, the uh, point of contact that should have been on the summons uh, mm -hmm. to and 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 the judicial branch is a separate branch of government and and uh, and they remind you of that periodically. Well, <laughs> they, they do, and, and and but it's appropriate. Uh, and and uh, statutes have been passed that give them more authority to do things on their own without having to rely on any of my executive orders. And so I, I don't want to preempt any decision that they might be. Uh, making uh, or anything that they might have under consideration. Okay. Um, uh, John of Leeville says, with the reluctance of citizens to take the vaccine, since most COVID illnesses last only a few days, why not simply let the vaccine run its course and move past this in a few weeks? Let the, the vaccine, the, I'm, I, I think they meant let the disease run its course. Well, how long is that going to take? Mm -hmm. um, we've been in this 18 months. It mm -hmm. hadn't run its course. And in fact, mm -hmm. the current Delta variant is much more uh, transmissible and more virulent than previous uh, forms of the virus. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and there is no running its course. We have people who are positive now for the third time. Mm -hmm. uh, and so vaccinations are absolutely critical if we are going to end this pandemic uh, and if we're going to slow transmission, a vaccinated individual is eight times less likely to contract the, the disease, mm -hmm. eight times less likely, 25 times less likely to be hospitalized mm -hmm. or to die. Mm -hmm. uh, and, and our hospitals are full today. Uh, we don't have the staff to take care of people today. Uh, so this idea that we let it run its course, uh, how many people would die COVID patients and non-COVID patients alike, if that were the approach that, that we were to take. Um, and that is not a recommendation that any reputable epidemiologist or, or scientist or anybody else is making. And, and that, that would be, um, I, I think that would be an absolute failure of leadership at, at all levels if that were the approach that we took. Okay. Um, Mary from New Orleans says, with the COVID variant affecting so many children, why start school now? Why not delay school? Yeah. Well, the recommendations from the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics is such that um, when masked, 100% masking, va vaccinated and unvaccinated, and, and by the way, there are no children under 12 who are vaccinated, yeah. right? Yeah. Only about 13% of kids between 12 and 18 are vaccinated. Uh, but but mass students uh, can safely be uh, uh, at school, and there are lots of reasons why we want kids at school uh, to include not just their education. And if you saw the the mm -hmm. report released by the Department of Education this week, we know that kids do much better in terms of their education yeah. if they're in person as opposed to mm -hmm. uh, participating virtually. But you also have social and emotional wellness. Uh, you have uh, things related to nutrition as to why those kids need to be on campus. Mm -hmm. And secondly, if you don't have uh, kids on school when it's scheduled, then you have a lot more people who can't go to work because their children are at home uh, mm -hmm. when, they're, when they weren't supposed to be. And that would actually have uh, uh, even, an even worsening effect on, on our capacity with respect to nurses and other healthcare professionals in our hospitals. Um, so we're, we're, we're looking at the recommendations uh, of the CDC and the American Academy of Pediatrics uh, to, to have school in place in person uh, and masked. Yeah. Um, uh, Martha from Harvey says, um, why don't you mandate personal, home personal health care staff to get the vaccine? And, and I guess maybe to extend the question a little bit, 
you know, what's your view of what different hospital groups are doing in terms of mandating employees to get the vaccine? Well, first of all, um, th there is a difference uh, between uh, approaches, generally speaking, uh, between private employers and, and state employers. Mm -hmm. um, and, and while I am not saying uh, that those public entities that are requiring vaccinations are acting unconstitutionally, what we know is that the Constitution is not implicated when a private employer does it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I support what Our Lady of the Lake did. Um, and if you look at the timeline that they have for their employees to come into compliance, mm -hmm. um, I, I believe that, that the vast majority of, of, of employees will choose to do it and, and it will happen uh, about the same time as full licensure is, is granted uh, to the vaccine under any circumstance. But I believe that the folks at FMOL uh, take their responsibility uh, to, to have a safe environment for their, their staff, but also for their patients and their visitors. And they understand uh, just how efficacious the vaccine is uh, in terms of promoting that safety and, uh, on their, on their uh, campuses. So I, I, I support the decision that they made um, and hopefully uh, people will not wait. And by the way, whether you're an employee of a healthcare facility or not, nobody should be waiting right now to get vaccinated. And, and that is some of the good news because we have over the last few weeks uh, a 300 percent increase in the people who are being vaccinated daily. Um, we're nowhere near where we, sh where we need to be, uh, but we are gratified by the, the increased uptake that we're seeing daily in terms of people being vaccinated. Do you know what the, that raises the question, do you know what the uh, higher uptake of vaccine rate that we're at now, what, how long would it take at this rate of people showing up to get to whatever the percent is that was the national goal? Well, the, 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 the national goal is to get everybody vaccinated, mm -hmm. uh, and, and certainly you don't have to have everybody vaccinated to really slow transmission mm -hmm. and reach that so-called uh, herd immunity. Mm -hmm. uh, but we're nowhere near uh, where we need to be right now. As I mentioned before, 37.1% uh, of our total state population is fully vaccinated. It's about 42, 43% have had one shot. The good news as we sit here today is about 82% of those people who are 65 and older have had at least one shot. Mm -hmm. um, and, and thankfully, at least up to this point in this fourth surge that has been the worst by far mm -hmm. of any of the previous surges, uh, we're not seeing uh, the same effect on older people, including in our long-term care facilities because of the very high uh, percentage of those individuals who have been vaccinated. And that demonstrates Mm -hmm. uh, both the safety and the efficacy of, of the vaccines. Yeah, that's a good point. Um, Chris from Lafayette says, what about requiring proof of, proof of vaccination or a negative test to enter large events like Saints and LSU football games? Yeah, uh, I think you're starting to see some of that uh, put in place around the country. We don't, and, and I think colloquially they're referred to sometimes as vaccine passports. Yeah. I mm -hmm. We're not, we're not uh, entertaining that here in Louisiana. Mm -hmm. um, but, but we do want people uh, to be vaccinated. It is incredibly important. We do need people to be tested if they've been exposed, if they have any symptoms. And remember, there are certain things we should always do. Stay home when you're sick. If you have a symptom, mm -hmm. uh, get tested. If you've been exposed, make sure that you're tested. If you're test uh, positive, make sure you're going through the isolation. Uh, if you're close contact and you need to quarantine, you need to do that. Mm -hmm. um, there, there's all sorts of things that people need to be doing. Uh, well, we are we are not uh, looking at implementing a, a vaccine passport in Louisiana. Yeah. Okay. Um, this comes from um, uh, Susan in Youngsville. Um, the mask mandate from earlier was never enforced. Are there any plans to do so with the new one? Yeah. Well, the enforcement provisions in this order, this proclamation, are the same as as in, in the previous proclamation. Um, and and look, this this answer may not be satisfactory. Uh, to some, but when you have 4.65 million people in your state, tens of thousands of businesses, these indoor venues uh, that people uh, will congregate in um, in public, uh, you're not going to enforce your way through it. Now we will. We have put out guidance to all the business owners. It's on open safely, and and uh, it's it was sent out to 35,000 
uh, businesses. Uh, we will respond to complaints and remind employers what the responsibilities uh, the responsibilities are. Um, and and if if warranted, uh, we will issue citations. Um, but the fact of the matter is, we need people to comply and understand we all have a role to play. We can't just simply say, well, the hospitals just need to increase their capacity. Well, we can't snap our fingers and, and, and create nurses and respiratory therapists overnight. Uh, we all have a role to play to slow transmission, to reduce case, gro case growth, to reduce hospitalizations and deaths. Um, and, and they are two things right now. The two primary tools we have are vaccinations and masks. Mm -hmm. uh, and masks are incredibly important given just the extreme amount of, of COVID in our communities and the fact that it's now at least 90% uh, the Delta variety, which mm -hmm. is more transmissible and more virulent. Yeah. Um, this comes from uh, Jim in Baton Rouge. Given the pandemic is a political issue, how about inviting politicians to spend a few hours in our overwhelmed hospitals and see firsthand what the medical staffs are up against? Yeah, um, well, first of all, that, that would be a good idea uh, for those people who, who do take a political approach to this, uh, which, by the way, I, I just do not understand. Uh, I promise you, Peter, that virus doesn't give a damn whether someone is a Republican, a Democrat, or an Independent. Um, and, and the idea that there's, that there's any philosophical or partisan approach to managing a public health emergency such as this, uh, a pandemic uh, of a highly contagious uh, and deadly virus, it just totally escapes me. And, and how people are so dismissive of science uh, and medicine. And, and, the, and the experts who are out there making recommendations about preserving life and the ability to deliver life-saving health care in, in our hospitals. Um, you know, it's, it is confounding and it is sad and ultimately it is dangerous. Um, the good news is I believe that, that more and more people every day are making the decision, in fact we know this, uh, to be vaccinated and, and I think they are taking the virus more seriously. Um, this idea early on that there's nothing, you know, more than the flu or whatever, you, you heard all that, uh, you know, more and more people are rejecting that and I think are becoming more reasonable and they're opening their minds to the reality of the situation and, and uh, I wish that that was universally the case, it is not. Yeah. What do, what do you, where do you personally, I mean, you're not a doctor, so where do you personally, um, who, who medically advises you yeah. and how, to what degree have you talked to people who are actually, you know, in hospitals treating the disease? Well, it just so happens that yesterday um, I had a uh, Zoom call with the medical directors of every tier one hospital in the state of Louisiana. I did that last week as well. Mm -hmm. um, but I routinely talk every single day uh, to Dr. Joe Cantor, the Office of Public mm -hmm. Health. Um, I rely on conversations that I have weekly with the White House task force looking at this, and it could be Dr. Fauci or Dr. Walensky. Uh, I personally review CDC. Uh, mm -hmm. For example, the, the last Friday they put out their morbidity and mortality weekly review that had the information out of uh, Massachusetts mm -hmm. that showed that while the vaccines are efficacious as, as advertised in preventing severe disease, hospitalizations, mm -hmm. and death, that, th that those people who did contract the disease were uh, were also contagious, uh, and and to a degree that that mirrored those who who were unvaccinated, which informed our decision to go forward with a mass mandate this week of both vaccinated and and unvaccinated, and it was further corroborated by uh, reports out of Wisconsin and Singapore, and I personally look at at all of those things um, and and try to avail myself of, of the absolute uh, best people. Um, and, and I think if you look at the press conference we did Monday and the array of, of uh, doctors uh, who were there, medical, uh, chief medical officers for their hospitals and, um, uh, and, and then uh, Dr. Klein, uh, the, the pediatrician specialized in, in infectious disease out of Children's Hospital, you know, they make an absolutely compelling case for how serious this situation is. Uh, what we need to do in the short term um, to, to get our, our numbers down and, per, and, and save people's lives, but also the fact that we need, all need to be vaccinated. 
Okay, I promised I would keep it to a half hour, so we have one last question, and this is from Smiley, okay. um, uh, who's survived COVID and lots of other things. Um, well, well, I'm glad to hear from you, Smiley, and so, I, I'm very, I'm very happy to know that uh, that you've survived and doing well. He's, um, he says, if masks prevented politicians from talking, are there any politicians you would order to wear a mask? <laughs> well, you know. Uh, I, there are some politicians who I think that need to close their mouths and open their minds, mm -hmm. uh, and 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 respect science, uh, mm -hmm. and uh, and you know do things that are actually constructive in in terms of of uh, promoting public uh, health uh, and so forth. But I'm going to decline to name names as tempting <laughs> as it as it would be. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't know that it would be helpful. I I am appealing to everybody, no matter what decisions they have made up to today about wearing a mask, getting vaccinated, whether they have been spreading misinformation, whether they have been intentionally undermining public confidence in these, these common sense proven uh, measures, today is a new day. And I don't care who you are, I'm asking you to reevaluate your position, be constructive, and, and base your decisions on, on science and, and on the public good. And if we will all do that, uh, we're gonna come through this faster and better uh, with with fewer people dying and that should be our goal and by the way we, you won't have as as long or a big as impact on our economy on people's livelihoods um, and and so forth so I'm, I'm appealing to everybody and and then I also appealing to people to to lift up our state and our people in prayer so okay well I appreciate all the time you've given us it's it's good to see you again maybe this will be the last time we do this about <laughs> COVID um, and we also appreciate the support of AARP and uh, your staff for setting this up. And so thank you very much again. Thank you so much, okay. Peter.